1 Samuel 1. We'll be reading it in its entirety. Now there was a certain man from Ramathim Zophim, from the hill country of Ephraim. And his name was Elkanah, the son of Jeroham, the son of Elihu, the son of Tohu, the son of Zuf, an Ephraimite. He had two wives. The name of one was Hannah, and the name of the other, Penina. And Penina had children, but Hannah had no children. Now this man would go up from his city yearly to worship and to sacrifice to the Lord of hosts in Shiloh. And the two sons of Eli, Hophni and Phinehas, were priests to the Lord there. When the day came that Elkanah sacrificed, he would give portions to Penina, his wife, and to all her sons and her daughters. But to Hannah he would give a double portion, for he loved Hannah, but the Lord had closed her womb. Her rival, however, would provoke her bitterly to irritate her, because the Lord had closed her womb. It happened year after year, as often as she went up to the house of the Lord, she would provoke her, so she wept and would not eat. Then Elkanah, her husband, said to her, Hannah, why do you weep and why do you not eat? And why is your heart sad? Am I not better to you than ten sons? Then Hannah rose after eating and drinking in Shiloh. Now Eli the priest was sitting on the seat by the doorpost of the temple of the Lord. She, greatly distressed, prayed to the Lord and wept bitterly. She made a vow and said, O Lord of hosts, if you will indeed look on the infliction of your maidservant and remember me, and not forget your maidservant, but will give your maidservant a son, then I will give him to the Lord all the days of his life, and a razor shall never come on his head. Now it came about, as she continued praying before the Lord, that Eli was watching her mouth. As for Hannah, she was speaking in her heart, only her lips were moving, but her voice was not heard. So Eli thought she was drunk. Then Eli said to her, How long will you make yourself drunk? Put away your wine from you. But Hannah replied, No, my Lord, I am a woman oppressed in spirit. I have drunk neither wine nor strong drink, but I have poured out my soul before the Lord. Do not consider your maidservant as a worthless woman, for I have spoken until now out of my great concern and provocation. Then Eli answered and said, Go in peace, and may the God of Israel grant your petition that you have asked of him. She said, Let your maidservant find favor in your sight. So the woman went her way and ate, and her face was no longer sad. Then they arose early in the morning and worshipped before the Lord and returned again to their house in Ramah. And Elkanah had relations with Hannah, his wife, and the Lord remembered her. It came about in due time, after Hannah had conceived, that she gave birth to a son, and she named him Samuel, saying, Because I have asked him of the Lord. Then the man Elkanah went up with all his household to offer to the Lord the yearly sacrifice and pay his vow. But Hannah did not go up, for she said to her husband, I will not go up until the child is weaned. Then I will bring him, that he may appear before the Lord and stay there forever. Elkanah, her husband, said to her, Do what seems best to you. Remain until you have weaned him. Only may the Lord confirm his word. So the woman remained and nursed her son until she weaned him. Now when she had weaned him, she took him up with her with a three-year-old bull and one ephah of flour and a jug of wine and brought him to the house of the Lord in Shiloh, although the child was young. Then they slaughtered the bull and brought the boy to Eli. She said, O oh my Lord, as your soul lives, my Lord, I am the woman who stood here beside you praying to the Lord. For this boy I prayed, and the Lord has given me my petition, which I asked of him. So I have also dedicated him to the Lord. As long as he lives, he is dedicated to the Lord, and he worshiped the Lord there. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. A famous author once said, Storytelling is the most powerful way to put ideas into the world. You may not understand that, but trust me, advertisers do. Think about the last time you saw a Lexus commercial. They were not selling you a car. They were selling you a dream. You ever noticed how in the Lexus commercial, there's never any traffic? <gasps> how the woman sitting in the passenger seat is always drop-dead gorgeous? Why is that? Because they're saying, look at this amazing world. It can all be yours for $68,000.
They're literally telling you a 30-second story and inviting you into that story. Car commercials aren't the only ones that understand the power of a story. God understands the power of a story, too. Do you know that two-thirds of the Bible is what we call narratives? You say, well, yeah, of course, because there's a lot of history there. That's true, there is history, but it is not just history for history's sake. Like a Lexus commercial, God definitely has an agenda in the stories that he includes. He is literally putting ideas into the world about who he is, and he is also showing us what it is to, to how we can participate in this world. And unlike a car commercial, the stories that God tells, they're about real people who are living real lives and who encounter a very real God. But let's be honest, sometimes when we read the stories of the Bible, it's not quite that easy. They're kind of hard to read sometimes, aren't they? A little hard to understand. There's people we don't know and places we don't know and customs we don't know. They can also be hard to apply. You know, when we read a New Testament story where it says, you know, the early church shared everything with each other, we think, well, I can do that. Somebody needs a truck, I can loan it. Somebody needs some money, I can give it. But when we read in the Old Testament that that the people of God went and destroyed the wicked cities next to them, does that mean we're supposed to go burn Charlottesville down or something? Like, what do we do with that? Well, for the next few months, we're going to make our way through some of the most beloved stories in the whole Bible as we start a new series in the book of 1 Samuel. And I don't want you to be intimidated. I don't want you to be unaware of how to read these stories. So before we jump into the text, I want to take just a moment and show you how you can read Old Testament stories and how they can benefit you in our Sunday morning times as you're reading as a family and better yet in our small groups when we discuss them. Three quick tips for reading Old Testament stories. Tip number one. Look for God. Look for God. Every chapter in the Bible tells you something about God. I know it's an odd thought, but in a very real sense, this book right here is God's social media. His profile is embedded in this media. And as we scroll through the timeline of Old Testament history, guess what you discover? God is telling you stuff about himself. Stuff he likes, stuff he hates. What he promises and what he expects. So as we read through the stories of 1 Samuel, I want you to pay close attention to wherever it says the Lord did blank. Because whatever's in that blank, you and I need to know it. Look for God. Number two, look for good. Look for good. By this I mean look for the good and the bad in the passage. 1 Corinthians chapter 10 verse 11, the Apostle Paul tells us that Old Testament stories, quote, happened as examples and were written down for our instruction. In other words, the the church is supposed to learn from Israel. And so as we make our way through 1 Samuel, I'll make it very simple so that even the children can understand, when you see people doing good things, do that. When you see people doing bad things, don't do that. But you'll discover in 1 Samuel, as we all do, that sometimes good and, and, and wrong, right and wrong, aren't as simple to navigate some of the complexities of life. And so we need wisdom 
and aware, be aware of foolishness and make sure that we can figure out how to make those decisions. So look for God, look for good, and number three, look for the gospel. Look for the gospel. Now, I don't mean look for the plan of salvation. What I mean is, anytime you're reading one book of the Bible, always remember there are 65 other books. And they're all connected. And so we have all of these many, 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 many stories, and yet when you put them together, they tell one giant story. And that giant story is called the good news of Jesus Christ. As our doctrinal statement says, the last line of Article 1 says this, quote, All Scripture is a testimony to Jesus Christ, who is himself the focus of divine revelation. In other words, we do not read the book of 1 Samuel the exact same way our Jewish friends read it. We agree with them on the history, and we agree with them on much of the morality, but we do not ultimately agree with them on the theology as to what it all means and where it's all going. And so, yes, the book of 1 Samuel, it points to, to Samuel. It points to Saul. It points to David. But we must also remember it also points us to Jesus. And we need to know and look for when it is testifying to the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. So if you find Old Testament stories hard, let those three tips inform you. Look for God, good, and the gospel. Anytime we begin a new series like this, I usually take the first Sunday and do an overview of the whole book. But as I was preparing this week, it dawned on me if I... If I told you all the stories up front, then you have no reason to come back next week. So I decided to call an audible, and let's just start directly into 1 Samuel chapter 1. Notice it begins in verse 1, Now there was a certain man. Now, anytime you see the word now or a, a place like this, a person like this, you got to ask when it's happening. This is roughly the year 1100 B.C. Think of it this way. The book of 1 Samuel begins where the book of Judges ends. In fact, if you'll do yourself a favor, flip back about two pages in your Bible to the last page of Judges 21. Notice Judges 21, the very last verse there says a very important phrase. In those days, there was no king in Israel. Everyone did what was right in his own eye. Now, that is the background for 1 Samuel. In other words, the people, instead of following their God, they were following their hearts, and that's always a recipe for disaster. Now, how did this happen? You may remember, Moses brought the people out of Egypt. Joshua brought them into the promised land. God said, drive out the Gentiles. They didn't do it. And so they spend the next few hundred years plagued by the idolatrous temptations of the pagans. The book of Judges, then, is a dizzying cycle of sin. Israel pursues paganism. God punishes them. They apologize. God sends a judge to deliver them. And then guess what happens? They go back into idolatry. And God punishes them. And they apologize. And God sends a judge to deliver them. And so the book of Judges is this this cycle where you see Israel basically spiraling out of control in their sin. And the end result is this verse here, every man did what was right in his own eyes. And so as we come to 1 Samuel, what's happening is God is going to show us how Israel moves from anarchy to monarchy. How this nation that was out of control is brought under the king that God puts in place. So all of that is crammed in that first word or two of 1 Samuel chapter 1. Turn back with me there. In verse 1 we meet this a man by the name of Elkanah. 
If you notice in that first verse there, he was a good Jewish man who was from a good Jewish town and from a good Jewish tribe. But not everything was good with Elkanah. How do I know? Look at verse 2. He had two wives. As the great theologian Scooby-Doo would say, rut row. <laughs> what is this about? Right off the bat, we're reminded what? Every man is doing what is right in his own eyes. Even this respectable Jewish man is doing this disrespectful thing. Now, I know this raises a lot of questions. Let me just say briefly, there's a big difference between what the Bible describes and prescribes. The Bible describes polygamy many times. It's not condoning it. It's just recording it. And this is one of those cases where we see when it describes it, guess what you discover? It's not described positively. In fact, every time in the Bible that it's described, you find out that one man plus two wives equals lots of problems. And that's going to be the case here. This is not God's design for marriage, as Genesis tells us. God's design is one man plus one woman for life. And so we see here that, that Israel has clearly gone astray. They're doing what's right in their own eyes. And so we discover here in this opening passage here that, that this man has doing his own thing. His first wife is named Hannah. His second, Penina. And all we know is that Penina has children and Hannah does not. Now, as soon as you read that a, a woman in the Bible is barren, your, your little, little bell should be going off. Right? That's actually, pregnancy is a really big storyline in the Bible. We can go back and think of Sarah. We can think of Rebecca. We can think of Rachel. We, we can even think of Eve, who was the mother all, of all living. The woman who was told that the, she was told the seed of the woman will crush the head of the serpent. Infertility and pregnancy is a huge storyline in the Bible. And this is one of those cases we're supposed to sit up and listen and we can begin to see Hannah's burden month after month. Every pregnancy test was negative. No doubt some of the women in this room know how heavy this burden feels. In this culture in particular, this would have been shameful. This would have been embarrassing. She would have felt inferior as if she was broken and something was wrong with her. And she comes to a very hard conclusion in verses 5 and 6, quote, The Lord had closed her womb. God is sovereign even over pregnancy. That, that doesn't make it any less emotional or any less difficult. And so Hannah has this burden. She has a childless womb. This family makes a trip to Shiloh. This is the place of worship at this point in Israel's history. And there are three priests in charge. If you notice in verse 3, they're mentioned Eli, Hophni, and Phinehas. Now, I don't know if you caught this vibe when you were reading, but when I read that verse and I saw those names, I heard the bad guy Darth Vader music play in the background of my head. Because you're supposed to. These priests are not great priests. These Holy men are unholy men, especially the two sons of Eli. And so we find there that they go up to make the sacrifice, and this is who's in charge. And so they bring their sacrifices, and, and what happens? Well, they would, the priests would take some of the meat. They would burn some to the Lord. The priests would take some for themselves to eat. They would give some back to the family. Then the family would have a big Thanksgiving-style meal, and they would all eat and rejoice. It would be a wonderful occasion, a blessed, happy moment for the family to gather and be grateful for God's goodness. But as we all know, holidays can be hard for dysfunctional families. And so in verse 6, we see that as they do this, Penina uses the occasion to provoke Hannah. She, is, she bitterly irritates her, it says. It's no accident. She does it on purpose. She rubs it in. You know people like this? 
they just find that thing, maybe passive aggressively or intentionally. We don't know how she did this. You can imagine them walking through Kroger and, and Penina pushing the baby stroller and bumping Hannah in the, in the heels and going, oh, sorry, too many kids, I guess, to keep up with. They sit at the meal times, and one of the children says, Mommy, Penina, why, why does Miss Hannah not have any children? And Penina says, I wonder why she doesn't have any children. That's a good question. Hannah, don't you want children? She finds a way to irritate her, to make her feel as if she's inferior. Her words would have cut deep with every snide remark. Hannah was being told, you're not a real woman, you're not a good wife, you're not a godly person, you must have done something wrong. Can you feel Hannah's burden? Seeing this, Elkanah tries to help. Verse 8, her husband said, Hannah, why do you weep and why do you not eat and why is your heart sad? Am I not better to you than ten sons? Now, I told you that in the Bible, in, in stories, there's good examples and bad examples. When it comes to comforting your wife, this is a really bad example, okay? <laughs> Elkanah basically looks at his wife and says, Honey, why are you so sad? You get to be married to me. <laughs> Men do not try this at home. And by the way, while I'm at it, listen, sometimes your wife, she doesn't need you to fix her problems. She needs you to hear her and hold her, and hug her, and love her. She doesn't need a lecture in place of love. And Elkanah here, maybe he's trying, but he's kind of clumsy about it. And you can imagine that even his words don't make her burden any lighter. It only makes it heavier on her. Do you feel Hannah's burden? Her own husband doesn't understand her pain. So if he doesn't understand, who is going to understand? Maybe God. So verse 9, she goes up to Shiloh, and there Eli the priest is. And notice in verse 10 what she does, greatly distressed. She prayed to the Lord and wept bitterly. Now the story kind of misleads you because it makes you think when she goes to Shiloh in verse 9 that she would talk to the priest. Because that was normal, right? The priest represents God to the people and represents the people to God. So if you need to do business, you go through the priest. But Hannah goes around the priest. She does something really bold, especially for a woman in this culture. She comes to this place and she herself cries out to God. This was a radical move of faith. She's not satisfied with the sort of outward, formal, institutional worship. Let's be honest, there are some times when you don't really just need another church service, you need to encounter God. And Hannah needs God. And so she cries out to him in personal faith. What a tremendous woman of faith she is. By the way, she's the only woman in the Old Testament that has said she goes up to the Lord's house herself. She's the only woman whose prayer is recorded in the Old Testament like this, and it's one of the longest prayers in the Bible. A tremendous example of faith. Ladies, can I just tell you for a moment, don't let anyone try to convince you that you are unimportant to the kingdom of God. Sometimes women need to show the men how it's done. And Hannah was showing everyone there how it's done. It makes me think of Lottie Moon, a woman who went from the shores of America to China to be a missionary and wrote letters back saying, where are the men? There's ministry that she couldn't do and she was begging for help. And to this day, women are, are a greater ratio of missionaries on the field Three to one. Women of faith. We should praise God for their example, for their boldness, willing to risk everything to trust God. And Hannah does just that. And so she pours out this prayer filled with grief and tears. And she is burdened. Now why is she so upset, crying and sobbing at the temple? Is it just because her rival wife is ugly to her? Is it just because her husband is, is kind of obtuse? 
There's something more going on here. You see, it's tempting to compare Hannah's situation here to the struggle of infertility today. And there may be some lessons that we can draw from this, but there is one major difference you have to keep in mind. Deuteronomy 7.14. God told Israel specifically, when I bring you into the land of promise, which is where they are, he says, when I bring you into the land, if you will obey me, if you as a nation will follow me, quote, there will be no barren females among you. Now, do you see the problem? Hannah realizes she's a barren female, right? This chapter's gone out of its way to say she's an Israelite woman, married to an Israelite man, living in an Israelite town from an Israelite tribe, going to the Israelite place of worship, doing the Israelite things, and yet she does not have an Israelite son, which means there is a serious Israelite problem. Either God is not keeping his word of Deuteronomy 7, 14, or it means Israel is not keeping their word. And it's as if it dawns on Hannah, we're in bad shape. In fact, her prayer here shows this is not just a personal fertility issue. This is a larger spiritual issue. Her concern is not just that her rival is shameless. It's not just that her husband is clueless. It's not just that her, her, her own um, womb is childless. It's that her nation is godless. This is not just about her menstrual cycle. This is about Israel's idolatry cycle. Every man was doing what is right in his own eyes. And hence they have violated God's covenant in Deuteronomy chapter 7. And Hannah sees this. And so, verse 11, she made a vow. Now, I know it looks like she's bribing God. God, give me a kid, and I'll give you something in return. But notice, she does not want a child for her own sake. She wants a child for Israel's sake. Look what she says. Do not forget your maidservant. Give your maidservant a son, then I will give him to the Lord all the days of his life. Hannah's burden was not just about filling a maternal hole in her heart. It was about filling a spiritual void in her nation. She realized if the priests are Eli and Hophni and Phinehas, surely we can do better than this. And Hannah says, God, if you will give me a son, think about what's happening here. When she she clearly has a spiritual goal in mind because she says, I will shave his head. Number six, this was a Nazarite vow. She was dedicating him to the Lord, and usually a Nazarite vow was temporary. It was for a period of time. But she says, I will dedicate this child for the rest of his life. Now think about what she's saying there. She is not simply saying that she's dedicating him in a symbolic way, even like we sort of do baby dedication. She is saying, I will give him up for adoption. I will give him to Eli. I will give him to be a priest in training. Because this is what we so desperately need. She would not have had a son to laugh with or play with or bond with because Hannah is not just thinking about what she wanted. She was thinking ultimately about what God wanted. And God wanted a nation where every man wasn't doing what was right in his own eyes. And by the way, if you don't believe me, just wait until next week when we get to her prayer. You think she would pray, praise God, I have a baby. She doesn't. She says, praise God, maybe now we can get a king. Her burden is for the glory of God in Israel. Not just for her own well-being, but that God himself might be honored and glorified and feared. You say, Pastor, I think you're making too much of this. Well, look what happens next. She's there praying before the Lord. Eli's watching her. Her lips were moving, but there was no sound coming out, and her voice was not heard. And look at the end of verse 12. So Eli thought she was drunk. Do you see the leadership crisis? 
in Israel? Here you have a high priest that doesn't know the difference between a praying woman and a drunk woman. I mean, how was that his first thought? Clearly, he is more used to people partying than worshiping. And he's going to imply that she's a worthless woman. And the great irony, if you know the story, is it's his own two sons who are worthless. And he is so obtuse, he doesn't even see with spiritual discernment what is happening right underneath his nose. He wouldn't know personal faith in God if it was five feet away from him. But Hannah doesn't relent. She explains who she is and what she's doing. And Eli seems to sober up and come to his senses. So in verse 17, he blesses her and reassures her. And then it says in 18, the woman went away and she ate and her face was no longer sad. Now, isn't that amazing? She shows up sad. She prays and then she leaves and she's not sad. But nothing's changed. Nothing's different. She's not pregnant yet. My friends, sometimes pouring your heart out to God can do wonders. Sometimes prayer is its own blessing. Going to God and bearing your soul with the great burdens that you have. Listen, before it changes things out there, there's a very good chance it's going to first change things in here. And Hannah, having poured out her heart, she leaves with a different mindset about God. It reminds me of Philippians chapter 4, verse 6, which says what? Be anxious for nothing, but in all things, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known unto God. And the peace of God, which surpasses all comprehension, will guard your heart and mind in Christ Jesus. Before prayer gets you answers, it will give you peace. And Hannah has that peace. And so she, in verse 19, they arose early in the morning and they worshiped the Lord and they go home. Elkanah knew his wife and the Lord remembered her. What a great reminder. This was not just a, a natural conception. This was a supernatural conception. God intervened. This is the language of Exodus. God recalling, remembering the plight, the affliction of his people. When it says God remembered, it's not just God went, bing, oh yeah, I forgot, there's Lady Hannah. No, it means God stepped in. It means God was going to do something. And God begins to work in this woman because of her faith and her prayer. And this is not simply about Hannah's faith. This is really a story about God's faithfulness. He had made a promise and made a pledge and he was going to keep it. And Hannah wanted to see it. In verse 20, we see that Hannah, the barren one, now becomes Hannah, the pregnant one. By the way, any time you're in the Bible and you're reading it, and you see a woman who doesn't normally get pregnant that winds up pregnant, it means God is about to do something big. Because a thousand years later, there's going to be another young woman who's not supposed to be pregnant, but is. In fact, she, she hasn't even had relations. She says, how can this be since I haven't known a man? I'm a virgin. And yet what? She heard what the angel said and she believed the promises of God. And she said, likewise, I'm the Lord's maidservant. D do unto me as you see fit. And what? She realized that what God was going to do was not just to fill her womb. God was going to fulfill his promise. That God was going to bring about the salvation of the world. My friends, this story is so much bigger than the way we so often read it. You see, the, the coming of Jesus Christ through Mary in, in the same way reminds us why he came. Why did Jesus come? Because you know what's happening in our own world? Every man is still doing what's right in his own eye. We're still stuck in our sins. We're still in rebellion against God. For all have sinned and come short of God's glory. And that's why God did not just send us another judge to temporarily deliver us. He sent us his son so that he might eternally save us. 
He sent his son to live the life we cannot live, to die the death that we deserve, and to grant salvation to those that repent and believe in him. God was up to something then, and through his son, the Lord Jesus, he's still fulfilling his promise. She calls the boy Samuel, which is a play on words. It means something like, I asked and God heard. Time goes by, Hannah tells her husband that she's waiting to go back to Shiloh. She says, let's wait until the child is weaned. That might have been two or three years, most likely. And so he goes up year after year, and when the time finally came, notice what happens in verse 24. Now, when she had weaned him, I love this woman. Look what she does. She took him up with her with a three-year-old bull and one ephah of flour and a jug of wine and brought him to the house of the Lord in Shiloh. Hannah is a spiritual force to be reckoned with. Do you see the picture here? This woman with a, with a preschooler under one arm, a bull in the other arm, a, a, a flower on her head, somehow holding a jug of wine, and she's making her way up to the front row. Nobody's going to stop her from worshiping God. Elkin is not helping in this case. She's bringing this. She's keeping her vow. Her burden has been lifted. God has heard her. The Lord has answered, and now she's going to praise him. She's going to worship him. She's going to exalt him because she knows he is a faithful God and that he has kept his word once again. And so she brings the boy to Eli, and she tells Eli who she is. Verse 27, for this boy I prayed, and the Lord has given me my petition, which I asked. So I have dedicated him to the Lord as long as he lives. Not a temporary time. As long as he lives, he is dedicated to the Lord. Hannah kept her vow. The book of Ecclesiastes says it is better not to make a vow than to make a vow with God and to break it. And she made this vow, and so she keeps this vow. And the son that she prayed for, the son that she wept for, the son that she begged for, she now gives him up. Why? Because Hannah understood. Hannah's burden was bigger than her own desire for a child. Notice the last sentence of verse 28. And he... Worship the Lord there. Some of your translations say they, but the Hebrew is actually more like he. I read this to my kids this week. They said, well, who's he? Is he Eli? Or is he Samuel? Either way, it's extraordinary. Because what does it mean? If it's Eli the priest worshiping the Lord, it means what? That Eli the priest who is maybe trying his best, but is is doing what's right in his own eyes, he sees the faith of this woman, he sees the prayers of this woman, he sees the commitment in this woman and says, wow, that's devotion to God. And now he turns and worships the Lord. If it's not Eli the priest, guess what? It's this child Samuel, which means now there's a preschooler putting everyone to shame. You say, that's ridiculous. Well, in the next chapter, it's very clear that, quote, the boy ministered to the Lord at the tabernacle. If the boy can minister to the Lord, surely the boy can worship the Lord. And so if that's the case, it's even more extraordinary. Either way, this is a new chapter in Israel's history. Either way, God is up to something. And either way we see in the very last line of chapter 1, we finally have a man who is doing what is right in God's eyes. But do you know why that is? Because first there was a woman who did what was right in God's eyes. A woman who set the example of faith. A woman who was committed to the Lord in her own heart. A woman who would not listen to the lies that were told to her about her worth and her value. 
A woman who would not be defined by the expectations of those around her, but a woman who trusted in the Lord with all of her heart. A woman who said, I'm going to believe God no matter what anybody else says. No matter my circumstances, no matter the challenges, no matter what other people want, I'm going to commit myself to the Lord. And it was through this woman's incredible faith that we see her burden is lifted. This is not a story about Hannah's womb being filled as much as it is about God's plan being fulfilled. Hannah's burden was not, give me a baby so my kingdom can come. It was, give us a godly leader so that thy kingdom can come. Hannah's perspective is so much more. And brothers and sisters, that is the challenge to us. See, listen, here's the challenge for some of us. We say, man, I, I, I want to be like Hannah. I want to pray. Be very careful when you pray. James chapter 4, verse 3 says, You ask and do not receive because you ask for the wrong motives, wanting to spend it on your own pleasures. Is that not sometimes the reason our prayers go unanswered? Because our prayers are about my kingdom, my job, my happiness, my fulfillment, me, 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 me. Maybe instead of, Lord, give me a new house so that I can live large, our prayer should be, Lord, give me a house so that I can show hospitality to strangers, so that I can welcome those who have no place to sleep, so I can care for the needy, and Lord, use it for the furtherance of your gospel. It's not God make me a teacher because my whole life I just want to be a teacher because I think that's important. But God make me a teacher so that I can bring you glory in the schools. So that the purpose of my life is tied into your larger purpose and your larger plan. Hannah's burden was this. That her little kingdom, as small as it was, would somehow advance God's big kingdom. And brothers and sisters, that is the plan, should be the plan for all of us. That whatever the Lord's entrusted with us, whatever he gives us, whatever he allows us to be stewards over, that we turn it back over and say, God, use this for your glory, not mine. Use this for your honor, not mine. Use this in a way that will make you known among the nations and people will know there is a God among us us. Hannah shows us what selfless devotion to God is. My friends, how about you? Are your prayers mixed in with selfishness? Are your desires and wishes and plans set up for your own happiness and your own satisfaction? Or have you submitted your plans and your thoughts to God's greater purpose? Lord, how can you use this to make disciples? How can you use this to bring others to Jesus? How can you use this to make your kingdom come? That should be our prayer. That should be our desire. That should be our burden, like it was Hannah's.